there is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. What's the matter, dear? Don't you hear it? Of course I hear it, Walter. It's that nice janitor fixing the pipes. Why don't you go on reading your book until he's finished? And when, pray tell, might that be? I'm sure it won't be much longer. Then the radiator will get just as hot as you want it. Isn't that what you told him? Yes, yes, I know what I told him. But why does he have to make so much noise? I'm sure I couldn't say. The decibel level in this apartment is beyond human endurance. Well, I suppose it's what they have to do with steam heating, that sort of thing. Ah, what I really don't understand is how you can sit by, knitting away, oblivious to this assault. Did you see the new wool scarf I'm making? It should keep out absolutely all the drafts. Well, that infernal pounding goes on and on and on. Wait till you try it on. I picked out your favorite colors. It's much thicker than the other ones. Oh. If I live that long. You wanted more heat, that's what you said. Well, now you'll have it and then some. Yes, I did. I certainly did say that. Won't that be nice? Hope springs eternal. The question is, at what price? Are you sure you're comfortable, darling? (laughs) I what? Oh, certainly. I am just comfy cozy. I'll fluff up the pillows. Did you take your aspirin? I'm on the verge of being hospitalized for pneumonia. Oh, now, really? It's not that bad. And that ape of a janitor out there is smashing my brain and ruining my sleep. But you weren't sleeping. You're reading. 5,000 Common Ailments and How to Treat Them. Is it an interesting book? <sighs> First he tries to freeze me to death, and then he tries to destroy my brain. Shall I plug in the vaporizer? That helps sometimes. It doesn't help at all. If it did, I wouldn't be in this condition. Yes, dear. Well, I won't stand for it. Lie down, Walter. No, I will not lie down. How can I? If I'm to die, at least it's going to be in comfort and peace. You there, Mr. Ape! Witness Mr. Walter Bedecker, age 44, afraid of the following. Death, disease, other people, germs, drafts, and just about everything else. He has one interest in life, and that's Walter Bedecker. One preoccupation, the life and well-being of Walter Bedecker. One abiding concern about society, that if Walter Bedecker should happen to die, how will it survive without him? But there's one thing he hasn't asked himself yet, and it's simply this. What happens if, despite all his precautions, Walter Bedecker should happen to stumble, not into the grave, but into the Twilight Zone? And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Escape Clause, starring Mike Starr, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. you a question. You want more heat, don't you? That's not the answer, so I'll ask you again. How much longer? Put it this way. In 20 minutes, it'll be about 105 in here. Hot enough to fry an egg. That good enough for you? 20 minutes, you say? After hour upon hour of your clanking around in my living room while I'm on my deathbed, I have to wait 20 minutes more? If you do die, Bedecker, and you go where I think you're going, as far as the temperature's concerned, you ain't going to be able to tell the difference. You ape! Get out! My pleasure. Are you all right, dear? Quick. Get 
the doctor. You mean again? There's a tightness in my my chest. It must be my heart. Come back to the bed. Call him now. Tell him to hurry. I don't think I have much time. Well, Doctor? Keep your mouth closed a few more seconds. I'll ask you a question. All right, open, please. There. Well, how bad is it? Hmm. What does that mean? Your temperature isn't bad at all. In fact, it's quite good. The thermometer wasn't in my mouth long enough. Oh, I think it was. I timed it exactly. I find that hard to believe. You'd better take it again. But why? I implore you before it's too late. There would be no point. You see, you have no temperature. What about my vital signs? Blood pressure's fine. Respiration and pulse, all normal. My throat? It's dry and achy all the time. (laughs) Well, that's because it's so hot in here. No sign of infection. Throat clear. Ears and nasal passages clear. What about... What about the pains in my back and my side? Well, what about them? And four sleepless nights in a row. Is it four now? How about that? Well, what do you want me to say? The truth. The awful truth. I can take it. The truth, Mr. Bedeker? Well, the truth is that it's, uh, well... Go on. It's psychosomatic. To use the scientific term. Psychosomatic. You're trying to tell me that I'm only sick in my mind? That's my considered opinion. And you're supposed to be a professional. Mr. Bedeker, may I speak candidly? I insist. Well, there is nothing wrong with you except the ailments you manufacture for yourself. Manufacture? Is that what you think? Your pains are imaginary. Your inability to sleep is a case of nerves, nothing more. In short, Mr. Bedeker, you are a very healthy man. This man calls himself a doctor. Four years pre-med, four years medical school, two years internship, two years residency. And what is he, I ask you, what is he? A quack. Doctor? Oh, hello, Mrs. Bedeker. What's the prognosis? Don't ask him. The man's an idiot. Walter, darling, I beg you, don't excite yourself. Um, Don't whisper. You're looking at half my troubles right there, Doctor. This woman, this awful woman who runs around whispering all day long to make me think I'm sick, even if I'm not. Oh, and I am. I'm lying here at death's door, and who's ushering me out? A quack and a whispering woman without without a mind. Well... (laughs) I'll call tomorrow, Mrs. Bedeker. Meanwhile, try leaving the window up an inch or so. Let some fresh air in. There'll be no need to call. Just come on over with the death certificate and fill it out. Oh, Walter. Don't drench me with those crocodile tears of yours. She'd be so happy to get rid of me. I just can't tell you. Goodbye, Mrs. Bedeker. Take care of yourself. I'll see you out. No need to show me the way. I know it by now. Doctor, how is he, really? Mrs. Bedeker, your husband is one of the healthiest patients I have. But he's sick most of the time. Is he? He won't let me air out the house. He says for every cubic foot of unfiltered air, there are 8,900,000 germs. (laughs) Well, he's probably right. And he's just quit his job. The fifth job he's quit since the first of the year. He says they make him work in a draft. Well... I suppose I'm oversimplifying it when I say there's nothing wrong with him, because in a sense, there really is. This constant worrying about himself is an illness of a sort. Has he always been this frightened a man? Ever since I can remember, when he was courting me, he told me he was in the final stages of TB and only had a week to live. I only married him because I felt so sorry for him. Oh, I don't mean that was the only reason. I think I understand. Do you? You see... People change, sometimes for the better and sometimes in ways that aren't entirely healthy. We all assign blame. Your husband is taking it out on those nearest him. It's not your fault. But it must be. He never stops complaining. The problem isn't physical. He's getting older, so he sits here spinning his wheels. 
he needs to get out, do things, prove he's still strong, that there's a place for him in the world. Oh, Doctor, I'll do what I can. I'm sure you will. You already have. It's up to him now. I'll give you a call tomorrow. I don't think it would be a bad idea if you took some vitamins yourself. You look run down, Mrs. Bettiger. I do? Just a little too pale. And though there's a draft in the air, and I feel a coma coming on. Yes, darling, I'll be right in. Now you remember about those vitamins. Promise? I promise. Here's a prescription. Get some of these items from the drugstore for yourself. Thank you, I will. You're very kind. Goodbye, Mrs. Bettiger. Goodbye. Did you say there's a draft? I did. From where? The window. But it's only open an inch. Freezing air blasting into the room. I'll close it for you. Do you know how many germs live in one cubic foot of air, Ethel? I think I do. Eight million nine hundred thousand, that's how many. I know you want me gone. Walter! Gone from your life, and that's why you leave windows open all over the place. But as a point of common human decency, couldn't you find a way to do it more subtly? The doctor said you needed air. He said it was stuffy in here. Oh, the doctor said. Tell me one thing. Yes? What is going on between you two? Nothing, Walter. I saw the way he looked at you. Oh, now you are imagining things. What's that slip of paper in your hand? What do you mean? Oh, this, it's only... Give it to me. Oh, now I understand. Well, if you'll let me explain... When did he give you this? Just now, before he left. If you'll listen... I'm not sick, he says, but nonetheless he gives you a prescription for medicine for me. Not a thing wrong with me, he says, but while I lie here helpless, he's out there telling you that I've got a life expectancy of 20 minutes. He said nothing of the sort. Don't deny it, Ethel. <laughs> I smelled the collusion the moment he left the room. Now I suppose he's making time with you behind my back. The two of you can hardly wait for me to expire. What a great day that will be. But just remember, it will be on your conscience. Yours and that... that quacks. The prescription was for vitamins, Walter, not for you, for me. Vitamins for you? I lie here while the life seeps out of me and that charlatan prescribes vitamins for you? What has he done for me? Not a nil, a big fat goose egg, that's what. He comes whenever you call. He's very interested in your condition. Very interested. Oh, isn't that nice? I'm dying, and he gives her vitamins. <coughs> <laughs> Sit up. I'll turn on the vaporizer. Uh, never mind. Go on, get out of here. Leave me to die in peace. All right, Walter. What? I meant I'll let you alone so you can take a little nap. Then maybe you'll feel better. I can't not. Why does a man have to die anyway? I'm sure you're not dying. Oh, are you? I asked you a question, Ethel. Why does a man have to die? I don't know, Walter. The world goes on for millions and millions of years, and how long is a man's life? This much, a pinch, a drop, a microscopic fragment. Why can't a man live 500 years or a thousand years? Why does he have to die almost the moment he's born? I told you I don't know, dear. No, you wouldn't. Go on. Get out of here. Yes, dear. Uh, I have to take my own pulse. <coughs> Give myself a checkup. A doctor couldn't care less. <laughs> my sinuses. It's moved from my chest to my sinuses. After that, it'll be my brain, and then poof. As if I never existed at all. What's the point? The point, indeed. It's a crime for a man to live such a short span of years. A crime. What I wouldn't give, what I wouldn't give to live a decent number of years. 200, 300. Why not five or 600? Yes. Why not? Or a thousand. What a miserable thing to contemplate. A handful of years and then eternity in a casket down under the ground. The dark, cold ground. With worms yet. Of course, with worms. And bacteria in the soil and 
All manner of filth and decomposition, toxic waste. Who are you? Gadwalder's the name. And immortality is my game. Your name is what? Cadwallader. At least that's the one I'm using this month. Rolls off the tongue, don't you think? How did you get into my bedroom? Let me see. Through the mirror? That would be a nice touch. Or through the walls? Hmm. Too prosaic. Look here, I... The truth is, I've never been gone. I've been in here for some time. You must have a fever. I'm hallucinating. Not at all. I've merely chosen to reveal myself in order to tell you that I subscribe wholly to your views, Mr. Bedeker. I mean, wholly. Delighted to hear it. I'll be brief, Mr. Bedeker. You look like a man with a nose for a bargain. I'd like to make a proposition to you. What kind of proposition? Each of us has something the other wants. And that seems a relatively solid basis for a bargain. Do we? Indeed. What in the world do you have that I could possibly want? Oh, many things, Mr. Bedeker. You'd be surprised. Many things. Varied and delightful. Now, what do I have that could remotely interest you? Actually, a minor item. Minor? Extremely. Are you sure? Smaller than minor. Insignificant. Of no importance whatsoever? Absolutely none. Microscopic? Teensy weensy. What did you say your name was? What's in a name, Mr. Bedeker? Just a question of semantics, after all. Language, a stretch of words. For example, what is it you want? Can you put it into words? I think you already know. You want an extended lifespan. Doesn't everyone? A few hundred years to play around with. Some people would call it immortality of a sort. But why give it that kind of description? Why make it sound so imposing? What would you call it, then? Let's call it... Let's call it some additional free time. After all, what are a few hundred years in the grand scheme? Or a few thousand? A few thousand? Or five thousand? Or ten thousand? What's the difference? The world will go on ad infinitum, so what's a few thousand years, more or less? Give or take, add or subtract. And this little item I'm to give you in exchange... Well, what do we call that? What do we call it? That's a linguistic conundrum. We could call it a little piece of your makeup. A little crumb off the crust of your, uh, structure. A fragment of an atom, so to speak, from your being. Or... Or a soul. Or whatever. After all, what is it? And when you're gone thousands of years hence, what will you need it for? Practically speaking. You're... Yes? You're the devil. What's in a name? I'm at your service. Good Lord. How about it, Mr. Bedeker? Why not? Uh, there must be a good reason. There must be. You deed me over your so-called soul and I'd give you immortality. Life everlasting. Or as long as you want it to be everlasting. And indestructibility, Mr. Bedeker. Complete and total indestructibility. Nothing can hurt you ever. Now that part's fun, let me tell you. Nothing can hurt me? And I live forever? Why not? Certainly. Forever. Again, Mr. Bedeker, just terms. And everything's relative. For you, it's forever. For me... It's a walk around the block, but we're both satisfied. Think about it. Oh, I am. I am thinking about it. To be without fear of dying. To be indestructible. Invincible. Not to have to worry about disease, accidents, pestilence, war, famine, anything. Governments and institutions disintegrate. People perish. But Walter Bedeker goes on and on. Walter Bedecker goes on and on. The ultimate dream, is it not? Mr. Cadwallader, about this soul, 
You say I won't miss it. You'll never know it's gone. And you say I'll go on and on, quite unable to succumb? Quite. No tricks? No hidden clauses? I'll just live as long as I want to live, is that it? That's it. That's precisely it. How about my appearance? I'm afraid I can't do much about that. Oh, I see what you mean. You should look pretty much the same. But in 500 years, I don't want to look like any dried-up old prune. Oh, Mr. Bedeker, you drive a mean bargain. A most difficult bargain. But you'll find me a cooperative, uh... man. All right, you win. We'll throw that into the bargain. Say it. Whatever aging takes place in your features will be more or less imperceptible. Mr. Cadwallader, I believe we're close to making a deal. Mr. Bedeker, you'll never regret this. Not to your dying day. Hey? Which by rights should not be for several thousand years. You'd better say that. There is something. Aha! 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 Now it comes out. For your benefit, I assure you. Where did you get that? The contract. Oh, one always seems to turn up when it's needed. Let's see. Article 93, right here. What about it? It's in the nature of an escape clause. Read it to me. Your escape clause. Whereas the party of the first part, upon due notification of the party of the second part, and so on and so forth. Go on, I want to hear it. Well, I'll just give it to you thumbnail. It's simply that if you get tired of living, Mr. Bedeker, you can exercise the clause by calling on me and requesting your... My what? Oh, there goes the embarrassing terminology again. Shall we say... your demise? At which point I will personally see to it that you are given a rapid and uncomplicated... How to put it? Departure? I can assure you, Mr. Cadwallader, that I'm not the sort of man to kill the goose that lays the golden egg. I'm much relieved to hear that. When you talk immortality to me, brother, I mean immortality. Indubitably. You're going to have a long, long wait. Mr. Bedeker, nothing will please me more. And I think we've got... Yes? A deal. No further qualifications? None that I can think of. No ifs, ands, or buts? None whatsoever. Absolutely? Positively. Done. Oh, no fires in here, please. Only a small one to heat up my seal. My cartouche, as it were. Do I get a copy? This is your copy. Where's yours? Already on file. In a very safe place. If you say so. You sure keep it hot in here. Mm -hmm. Quirk of mine. I think the wording seems to be in order. Cadwallader, where did you go? Walter, did you call for me? What? Oh, no, no, no. I was only... Uh... Only what, dear? Uh, I'm talking to myself. You were? Not that I make a habit of it, mind you. What are those papers? Nothing. I, I mean, I was just looking over my uh, my life insurance policy. Whatever for? To be sure you're... You're protected. If anything should happen. Ever. To me, that is. Don't be silly. Your health's going to improve. It's already improved. Hit me. What? Hit me. As hard as you can. In the stomach. Or anywhere else you like. Anywhere at all. But why? I want you to see how strong I am. Strong as a bull. As a bull? And is indestructible. Ten bulls, a hundred. Walter, you're not yourself. Come sit with me in the other room. It's warmer there. The radiator's going full force. Is it? See for yourself. Yes, I think I will. Watch this. What are you doing? Don't touch it. See what I mean? Walter, your hands are burning. No, they're not. That's just it, Ethel. They're smoking, yes, but... They're not burned at all. I'll get some bandages. Sit down. Where do you keep my pills? Which ones? All of them. Every last one. Over here on the tray. Give it to me. What are you doing? Walter, the window. Don't throw them out. I beg you all your medication. Why not? What's the difference now, my dear? I'd like to introduce you to someone. W what are you talking about? Me? 
the new Walter Better Girl. Get your paper! Boy rescued from well, lives to tell about it. All the latest news, right here. Let me see that. Sure, mister. Two bits. A little boy, huh? Yeah, the one that fell in the hole. They got him out alive. Ain't that something? It's something, all right. A ten-year-old boy and he's on the front page of every newspaper. He was down there for 18 hours. Can you believe it? And everybody thought he was a goner. It's amazing is what it is. Of all the news stories in the world, this, this little nobody makes the headlines. You think that's amazing? Wait right here. I'll show you amazing. Hey, where are you going, mister? You owe me 25 cents. Watch this. Oh, watch where you're going. Excuse me? Hey, buddy. I must get to the corner. Some people are so rude. You don't want to miss the cross town? Wait your turn, do you mind? Look out. Get back on the curb. There's a bus coming. That man, stop. I, I couldn't stop. He ran right out in front of the bus. I saw the whole thing. That guy must be blind. Somebody call an ambulance. Look, he, he's getting you up. Hey, pal, how'd you do that? <laughs> do what? Are you, are, are you okay? Of course I am, you idiot. I can't believe it. I didn't even see you. Is there a photographer in the crowd by any chance? Y you better lay down. The ambulance is coming. Why would I want to go to a hospital? There's nothing wrong with me. Not a thing. Just your tire tracks on the front of my suit. Just the same. Take it easy. Get some x-rays and I'll, I'll fill out an accident report. Don't bother. Just contact your claims adjuster. The name's Bedecker. Can you remember that? Walter Bedecker. It don't make sense. I could have sworn I ran over you. Oh, you did. Then how come you can walk? Like they used to say, you ain't seen nothing yet. One survivor, Walter Bedecker. By now, these words should be familiar. You've heard them before on the Eyeball News, and if the past is any indication, you'll hear them again and again. It started when he was hit by a bus, then a car, and finally a subway train, but that wasn't enough for Walter Bedecker, the man whose luck never runs out. After an explosion at a construction site, what else could happen? Last week's plane crash killed 23 people, but not Mr. Bedecker. He's certified as the unluckiest man alive and the most indestructible. Is that you, Walter? Uh, he's all right, ma'am. Aren't you, Mr. Bedecker? You're all right. When you didn't come home, I was worried. Oh, uh, this is my wife. Um, wait in the other room, dear. Are you sure I can make you some hot tea and your friend? He's no friend. He's a claims adjuster. In the other room, Ethel. Now. Yes, dear. You want to sign this now, Mr. Bedecker? $5,000, is that all? For falling down an elevator shaft? Well, considering that you're not even scratched, Mr. Bedecker, I think the company's being very fair. Just keep your mouth shut, will you? I'll sign it just to be done with you. And can I expect the check by tomorrow? Well, first thing in the morning, uh, by special messenger. Just sign here. Uh, waves all claims. Receipt of some... Indemnifies company. All right. Very good, sir. Very, very good. I'll show myself out. Hello, Steve. Hey, Jack. What are you... Oh, you too? Yeah, the subway accident. <laughs> Elevator shaft here. Right. You out, you in. <laughs> so long, Steve. Yeah, see you, Jack. You have my check, I presume? $10,000, Mr. Bedecker, if you'll sign right here for it. If you insist. Fourteen accidents. More than anyone should have to bear. Now, wouldn't you think that there would be an element of thrill in fourteen accidents? I'd appreciate it if you'd step away from the window, Walter. It's open, you know. Fourteen accidents in which you know nothing can happen to you? I guess so, dear. Well, it's a fact. 
There should be an excitement to this sort of thing. Well, there isn't. It's dull. It's absolutely without the remotest bit of excitement. In short, I'm bored stiff with it. Walter, dear, you should count your blessings. After all, there is the money. And you should shut your mouth. You look for all the world like a small gray mouse waiting for a piece of cheese. Walter, you can be so terribly cruel. Ethel, please. I'm thinking. I swear he's cheated me somehow. I don't know exactly how. What are you talking about? Who? Mortal schmortal. What's the good of it when there aren't any more kicks? Any more thrills? Anything to let a man know he's alive? Walter, do you feel all right? At least when I was concerned about my health, there was an element of risk, of danger. I mean, of course. That's it. What is? Iodine. Iodine? Have we got any? What for? Did you cut yourself? Do we? I suppose in the medicine cabinet. Get it. Now? And rubbing alcohol. And ammonia. Walter? I'll get it. You find me a drinking glass. A large one. There's one right there. Ah, I'll mix them all together like so. And stir them up. Wait! And drink it. Oh. Ah. Sit down. I'll call the doctor. You see? What I just drank should kill a dozen men. To me, it tastes like lemonade. Walter. Yes? What's this all about? You really want to know? All right. I'll tell you. In a word, I am immortal. Walter, don't joke like that. It's true. I made a pact with a guy named Cadwallader who's given me immortality and indestructibility in exchange for my soul. Your soul? More succinctly than that, I couldn't put it. Why don't you sit down? I'll make some tea and then we'll call the doctor. You will not make tea and you will not call the doctor. Why not? If you had any imagination at all, you could tell me what there is I might do to get a little excitement out of it all. I've been in subway crashes, bus accidents, major fires, disasters, one after another, and now I even drank poison. Nothing. You know what I've been thinking? I've been thinking I'll go up on the roof and I'll throw myself down the light well. Smack dab through the light well, 14 stories down, just for the sheer experience of it. Oh, Walter, darling, please. Ethel, darling, shut your mouth and get out of my way, please. Walter, please, darling. Ethel, go drown in a tub and leave me alone. I'm going headfirst down the light well. Get out of my way. Walter, no. Will you get out of... Ethel, be careful or you'll trip. (laughs) Ethel! I wonder what that felt like. Operator, get me the police, please. Immediately, it's an emergency. Hello? Is this a police station? This is Walter Bedecker, 11 North 7th Street. That's right, apartment 14B. Will you please come over here right away? No, no trouble. I just killed my wife. That's right. Yes, I'll stay right here. Goodbye. Now, this is going to be an experience. Hey, Bittaker, you got a visitor. Cooper, the legal beagle. Right in here, Mr. Cooper. No longer than 15 minutes, please. How are you holding up? As well as can be expected. Prisons are boring places, you know. Very, very boring. And you? How am I? I'm miserable, Mr. Bedeker, and I've been miserable since I took your case. I've had tough clients before, but nobody like you. Really? 
What disturbs you? What disturbs me is that for five days in that courtroom, you've acted like a man desperate to get himself convicted. Oh, whatever would make you think that? When the prosecuting attorney cross-examines you, you act like you're betting on him to win the case. The truth will out. Now look, Bedeker, tomorrow's the last day of the trial. There'll be the summing up and it'll go to the jury. And as things stand now, you don't have a chance in hell. That a fact. That is a fact. Now, tomorrow, this is what I want us to do. Cooper, do me a favor, will you? Put it away. How's that? Bedeker, didn't you get what I was trying to tell you? You're about 12 hours away from a guilty verdict on charge of first-degree murder. Oh, ooh, ooh. what will the penalty be? The penalty in this state for first-degree murder is death in the electric chair. Death in the electric chair. Bedeker! And if I were in California? What? How would they try to kill me if I lived in California? Capital punishment there is the gas chamber, but I don't see... And in Kansas? In Kansas, it's hanging, but I'm going to tell you something. Better. No, Mr. Cooper, I'm going to tell you something. The only thing they'll get for their troubles if they try to electrocute me is a high electricity bill. Good night, Mr. Cooper. See you in court. Guard! I don't know, Bedeker. I just don't understand you. The psychiatrist says you're sane, and you say you killed your wife. But way down deep, I know you didn't. So tomorrow, when I sum up for you, I'm gonna lead from a terrible position. A position of weakness. But I'll do the best I can. Mr. Cooper, really, don't bother. Mr. Bedeker, you've been tried and found guilty of murder in the first degree. Have you anything to say before the court pronounces sentence upon you? <sighs> oh. oh, I don't have anything to say, Your Honor. Not a thing. Then the court sentences you to imprisonment in the state penitentiary for the rest of your natural life. I knew we could do it, Bedeker. Hmm? I knew we could get you off without the death penalty. If I do say so myself, I gave that summation everything I had. Wait a minute. Does this mean that... It means that you're not going to the electric chair. You've been given life instead. You're a very fortunate man, Mr. Bedeker. Life? Did you say life imprisonment? Uh, oh. We need help here! My client's fainted! Here's your last meal. My last? With us. You're going to the penitentiary tomorrow morning. The penitentiary. For life. Look at it this way, Mr. Bedeker. What's life? 40, 45 years? You can do that standing on your head. Life. That's all. 45 years. <laughs> Maybe not even that much. After all, what are a few hundred years in the grand scheme? Or a few thousand? Or five thousand? Or ten thousand? No. 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 No! <laughs> Mr. Bedeker. Yes? About the escape clause. Care to utilize it now? Yes. That's a wise man. Odd thing, Mr. Bedeker. You look like someone having a heart attack. Exactly. Like a man having a heart attack. Bedeker! Bedeker! You all right? No pulse. Must have been his heart. He's dead. Poor devil. There's a saying. Every man is put on earth condemned to die. Time and method of execution unknown. And perhaps this is as it should be. 
Case in point, Walter Bedecker, lately deceased. A little man with such a yen to live that he was beaten by the devil, by his own deadly boredom, and by his place in the scheme of things, including his position such as it is, or was, in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Escape Clause, starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling and adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Peggy Roeder, Rich Kamenick, Doug James, Turk Muller, Guy Burrill, Heath Corson, Larissa Borkowski, Natalia Reed, Peter DeVito, John Starr, Carl Amari, Paul Patch, and Lynn Foley. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.